One thing I wanted to ask you about is I, you mentioned this idea of like, there's no such thing as like body and mind, like the separation. And I wanted to get you to elaborate on that because I've always had this perspective of like, there are, there's like a, I just wanted to understand that better just to have that knowledge one. And then two, if it links in, I wanted to ask about like, basically there's a specific idea that I've always explained it in my head and other people that there's like logic based things and there's like non-logic based things. And I used to call that like the mind and the body, but like logic based things have always been to me like, you know, when I used to do software development and I used to go online and learn all these things and then like mind based things are like, you know, some of dancing, you know, some of meditation, spirituality, somatics and stuff like that. Um, I'm, I'm ranting a bit here. Yeah. So I wanted, I wanted to ask about the, the body mind relationship and then like, that's first question. The second question is like, is there a better um, way to split out those things that are more like logical related versus non-logical related? Okay. So the first thing I'll tell you is I did a whole write-up on this, on body-mind, and it's called There Is No Mind-Body Connection, There Is No Mind-Body Split. Mind and body are concepts. They're associated with experiences, but they're still concepts. This age has made an idol of the thinking mind, and everybody takes pride in, well, they take pride in the thinking mind, or they take pride in being buff. Okay, those are kind of two distinctions. Okay, being buff also includes all manner of physical activities, athletics and sex and all the rest of this business. But they're all basically mental references. The experience doesn't contain any separation. Only the thinking about it does. So if you attend to a sensation a you have, like what you're doing with your mouth right now, mm -hmm. there's a feel to it. There's no mind plus body. There's only the direct experience, the feel of it. But you, but you can mentally analyze it and you can say, oh, this is my mouth muscles or this is a sensation or this is my emotion. And these are just ways of <laughs> highlighting different kinds of memories. But they're all conceptual. The experience doesn't contain any of those separations. It's all just the experience. Isn't there some things that are more like... And I know you're gonna say no, but I'm isn't there some <laughs> <laughs> isn't there some things that like you know some like me moving my mouth is like okay, like that's almost autonomous. But there are certain actions where like you know I may have to think more than like I may have to think more in an action where I'm doing a test. And sure, I'm like writing a bit, but like I'm more like, hmm, I'm thinking in my head versus like a like me going to a gym and just pounding weights. Well, once you've learned something, there's a lot less need for mentalizing about it. The yep. first time you had to learn about how to use different kinds of weights and number of reps and sets and all that. See, that was all conceptual. Again, it's all mind-based. Mm -hmm. But the experience itself, when you're doing it, doesn't have any distinction between that. When you're doing a movement, a rep, you're not busy thinking, oh, now I'm doing a rep. You're feeling the action. Right. Even though there is reps and sets going on. From the mental perspective, you can say so, but in your immediate experience of it, there's just the experience. There's not... Uh, there's just the feeling. feeling. Yeah, that's right. Just the feeling of the action. Because it's, like, it's not like you feel yourself. Like, how do you... Like, feeling, even trying to feel yourself think, that's just a sensation. That's right. How do you know you're thinking? You feel the thinking. Yeah. So and that's when, all there ever is. That's creepy. 
Well, that's that's the perennial philosophy, non-duality. Meditation is embedded in that perennial philosophy, which says there are not two. This is where the concept of oneness, as badly as it's understood and used these days, comes in. Oneness right. is not an idea that people have. Like, oh, I'm an idealistic think we're all one. This is baloney. That's just mind chatter. Oneness isn't a concept. It's a direct experience of your own existence. And when you pay attention to, let's say, hearing my words, there's no two here. There's not me and you. There's just the experience of hearing. Yep. So in the Upanishads, there's a saying that the experiencer... The experience and the experiencing are one. But if you think, wait a minute, I'm an experiencer and I'm having an experience and that's the experiencing, then you're gone conceptual again. The r direct experience of it, there aren't three, there's only one. Interesting. That makes sense. So um, when you're taking a test, of course, you're using your mental faculties, memory in particular, to equate those memories to concepts, words, which is what a test consists of, mm -hmm. right? So again, the idolatry of the age is the thinking mind. The idol is the thinking mind. And so really smart people are either revered or reviled, right? That's, that's the idolatry of the thinking mind. And by God, that's a massive pathology. That's why people elect idiots like Donald Trump, because they're not feeling, they're thinking. They've narrowed their intelligence to an issue instead of the feeling, which is where conscience lives, by the way, and where foresight lives. Foresight isn't analytical, it's intuitive. Did I uh, answer that question for you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so so I guess a good way to that makes sense. It's just the experience that makes sense. Um, but I can still use the the example of like the thinking mind mm -hmm. is a way to distinguish like like certain like that's more of like even though there's just the experience, there are people that try to. Is it still okay to distinguish certain things or activities with like the thinking mind versus the non-thinking mind? Yeah, it's a faculty. There's a difference between using a faculty and being convinced that that is the, the reality of things. See, concepts are not the reality of the experience. They're merely a representation. The experience contains its literally infinite facets. Concepts extract a few of those facets. Right. Conceptual mind is always partial at best. Experience is always total and ineffable. And what that means is it can't be reduced to mind. And that's what ineffable means. It can't be reduced to mind. And everything is ineffable. But from the point of view of the thinking mind, people reduce everything to particular qualities or aspects. So let's use an easy example, say appreciation of women. Now some people will think, oh, I am an ass man or I'm a leg man, right? And they're reducing the woman to that, but she's obviously vastly more than that. Mm -hmm or these poor fools wouldn't get raked over the coals the way they do with some women, right? Mm -hmm. They've tried to reduce her. They went for the one thing that they've labeled as the ideal, and then by George, there was a lot of stuff they didn't take into account. If they're feeling, they'll still never be able to reduce it to concepts, but they will get stop-and-go signals that are felt. Same thing with conscience, same thing with foresight. Same thing with intuition. So you might say it this way, words are digital, experience is analog. 
What do you do with analog in order to record it? You reduce it to make it digital. So in CDs, such, it's 44,100 chops per second, which leaves out zillions of harmonics, which is why digital music sounds thin compared to live or analog music. And analog is limited by the effects of a 60 cycle electric current, so that's a digitizing also, but it's got vastly more information in it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with the continuous tone photo versus a half tone. You know the terms? Dots. When you look at a newspaper, the photos are all made of dots. Big dots, little dots. That's called, uh, that's the, it's called half tone. But if you look at a photograph, not the reproduction, it's all continuous tone. And if you look at the actual item that's being photographed, it even has more richness of information. So words are digital. They lose an awful lot. But people who are adherents to the idolatry of the mind think that's good enough, just the way people who are into technology think that a CD is good enough. They don't know that they're missing a lot of feeling from the experience because a lot of harmonics are gone. Right. Makes sense. Now here's the problem of the age. Because people are educated into the digital mind, that is word mind, and they are reinforced for that and rewarded and punished for it, they become identified with the thinking mind and they walk around thinking I'm a mind in a body. Is It does feel like that sometimes though. The feeling is the very invalidation of the belief. Because they're the feeling mind. And the feeling is the body. Because, I mean, a lot of times the body can affect the mind. Even. Not even. Let me explain <laughs> a little bit about that, okay? It's not that one affects the other. It's that a change of one is a change in the other. It doesn't happen one before the other. They happen exactly at the same instant because they are the same thing. Right. So if you stub your toe and you go, that was clumsy, right? The rising of the that was clumsy occurs along with the onset of the pain reaching a certain threshold, you know, triggers it. They go together. They aren't two. Right. Back to that, not two. So if you do somatics and you notice emotionally you feel better, it's because you've dispelled the stress pattern that you felt as an emotion. Um, if you do somatics, you will feel, say that again. If you do a session of somatic education exercises and afterwards you feel better emotionally than when you started. Yeah. It's because during those action patterns, you were dispelling the stress patterns that you feel as emotion. Mm -hmm. And your thought patterns change. I'll tell you a brief little something, very brief. There was one afternoon when I was doing some somatic education exercises and I had recognized that the smoothness of the movement got interrupted or made uneven by thinking. I noticed that whenever I was thinking, the movements were raggedy or more so. So I deliberately smoothed the movements out by an act of will and practice. Lo and behold, not only did my mind fall silent, the entire environment in which I was doing it, including the outside the window stuff, fell silent. This was unexpected. I could see you know, my mind falling silent, but the whole environment around me also fell silent as I got those movements way smooth. I used to bring my entire life to a halt by doing sets of 
somatic education practice, and I would notice that when I got really, really balanced, it would feel like my life would come to a halt. No new developments were occurring. And then by letting myself go, developments resumed. And that's Question. something you'll hear a lot. <laughs> but you could, as an onlooker, I know you're going to disagree, but I'll say this anyway. Maybe. Um, <laughs> as an onlooker, you could say his what he did in his body um, had an effect on his mind. And now I know I know that's incorrect, but could you at least not? It could could someone make an argument that by doing that. Even though it's not true, it helps a normal layperson understand it better because they already think in those terms and you're like translating it to meet their definition. Now you just use the term think. <laughs> and they've reduced the experience to the conceptual mind. Mm -hmm. If a person were an onlooker and not just thinking hypothetically, they would experience in themselves a quieting of their own mind as they were watching this person whose own mind was quieting. How do you know? Go around a person who's a little nuts and knows what it does to your own mind. Okay, Not two. They are continuous. There's, it's a field effect. So if a person was really an onlooker, they would start feeling more and more quiet and peaceful until the first stage for them would they forget that they were watching and they'd start falling into reveries, daydreams. They wouldn't be able to keep their attention on what they were watching because they were being drifted away into daydreaming. If they have the presence to stay present, they would pass through the episode of daydreaming. That would fade out and they would be observing something, but they would be experiencing it again as having less and less quality or activity. But the but the big key word there is if. Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. You, you pre presented a hypothetical situation. And I'm saying, you know what, do it and find out. Because your hypothetical scenario is based on some assumptions that haven't been tested. No, no, no. So I, I, I think... Now having your explanation, it's more helpful to think of the experiences as connected. Yeah, and you can have more accurate thinking and less accurate thinking. If it's based on a direct experience, it's going to be more accurate. If it's based on just hypothetical ideas based on the current accepted norms of thinking, then any dingbat thing can come in. And I here's dingbat, say trickle down theory, total dingbat thinking. Uh -huh. Okay, but it was accepted, and is in still in some quarters. Same thing you, with. Go ahead. Uh, oh, um, do you not think? I feel like. I feel like sometimes, and again, I, I think I think it it makes sense for me to think that way, but I feel like sometimes. Like when we need to reach out to other people and explain concepts, like I feel like it would be, like you say, it would be very hard for a lot of people in this day and age to even like, for you to explain to them like, oh, like there's no, there's no mind body. There's just one experience. And so like, do you ever, do you ever run into situations where in order to explain something to someone, you sort of have to like translate it all and the like, time. And like bring it down one level to a point where it's not even necessarily true. You're just like, okay, this is the way I have to translate this for now. And then like you give it to them like that. Well, yeah, here's how I do it. I use the language that ties with their experience. If I use language that didn't tie to their experience, it would sound like gobbledygook to them. If I tie it to their experience, they have memory, and the memory isn't word mind. It's felt, or it's sensory in any case. Mm -hmm. So I use people's language to get them to the ballpark. Their own memory of the terms I'm using gets them to 
the batter's cage. Or oh, let me use another one. I use dance floor. Okay. So, <laughs> Wait, is this what you do? You're like, what are you doing in your constructor? This is like a construction site. <laughs> I don't want to use it like that. Yeah, I am. I'm using what I'm, what I have available. Since right. you dance, I can say that the language will get you to the dance studio, and your memories will get you to the dance floor. But your direct participation is where it comes alive and actually makes sense to you. Now, I just demonstrated. I used the sports analogy and I used the dance analogy. Notice the dance analogy touched home better. It, it communicated better. Um, yeah, I mean, it did. I mean, you have to admit. Um, yeah, you have, to, you have to participate. It's not just showing up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Should I, should I do that? I should just like ask people what they do and just like use those, use your metaphors. That's right. what I do. When somebody asks me about my work, first thing I do is I ask them what their experience is in some ways, what they're, you know, what they're familiar with, and then I use language that is familiar to their experience because it has memory to them, the words do. So the answer is yeah. If you want to reach somebody, Find out what their frame of reference is. Find out what dances they're familiar with and then use the steps of those dances to teach them a different dance. Mm. If you were a chef, I would say use ingredients they're familiar with and teach them a new recipe. Okay, makes sense. All right, that is all the questions I have. All right, then. <laughs>